So we've been talking uh, all month about how to prepare the way for Advent, how to prepare the way for the arrival of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. That's what the word Advent means, is the arrival of a notable person. And of course, there's no one more notable than Jesus, right? No one's changed the world more than he has. And along the way, we've also talked about God's model for how we can successfully launch any vision that we might have, any dream, any business, any ministry. We said that God showed us the way to launch any kind of enterprise. He says there's four key steps. You have to plan, you have to prepare, you have to proclaim, and then finally the one we're talking about today. You have to actually produce. Because all of the planning and all of the preparation and all the proclaiming in the world doesn't matter if you can't actually produce your intended results. You've got to make it happen somehow. And so with the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, that's when God really began producing everything that he had planned for the redemption of humanity. John 1, 12 through 13 tells us, Yet to all who did receive him, to, G- to all who received Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave, what did he give? He gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. And so this was the big idea. This was the big idea of God's plan. This was God's ultimate goal. This is what God ultimately wanted to produce. And this goes all the way back to before the beginning. God had already planned you. God had already planned for you to be part of His family. God wanted you to receive His Son. And so God knew rebellious human beings would want to become His children again, and He had to provide a way for them. And so through receiving and believing in the name of Jesus, God's only begotten Son, God made that possible. And to really cover everything that God produced, even just through the first century after Jesus' birth and death and resurrection, we would have to study the entire New Testament today. And even now, over 2,000 years later, our God is continuing to produce, to deliver on His plans and His promises to the return humanity to the state of eternal life with God that He always intended for us from the beginning. And so we don't have time to go into all of that today. Today we're just going to look at a couple of verses from Luke's Gospel. So we're going to pick up right where we left off last week, and we're going to read about two events that happened 40 days after Jesus' birth. Mary's purification time, according to the law in Leviticus, had completed after giving birth, and she and Joseph took Jesus to the temple for his purification rites And they were, of course, devout Jews. They were fulfilling the requirements of the law by bringing Jesus to the temple. And then we read this in Luke 2. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. So this man had spent his whole adult life waiting and hoping that he would actually get a chance to meet the Messiah in person. And God, through the Holy Spirit, had promised him he would get to do that. He would not pass away until the Messiah had actually come. That's a great promise to know that before you die, you're going to see the Messiah. God had already been preparing and proclaiming to Simeon long before Jesus' actual arrival, and now he was about to see the fulfillment of God's plans and preparation. He was about to see what God had ultimately produced. And so let's read a little bit more about Simeon, beginning in verse 27. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. If you were here last night, you might remember I mentioned the Hebrew word for salvation is Yeshua, uh, the Hebrew name of Jesus, Yeshua. And so Simeon would have been a Jew at this time. He would have been speaking Hebrew, and he would have said, For my eyes have seen your Yeshua as he's holding the baby Jesus. Isn't that incredible? And so God had so prepared Simeon and proclaimed the arrival of Jesus to him that when he saw Jesus, nobody had to tell him who he was. He instantly recognized him for who he really was, the Messiah. He wasn't just another baby at the temple courts. Here was the promised Messiah 
finally on the scene, ready to produce the light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. Let's jump right back into verse 33. The child's father and mother, this is Mary and Joseph, marveled at what was said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. In other words, not everybody's going to agree that this is the Messiah. Not everybody's going to want to follow him. Not everybody's going to want to accept him. And we're going to see people choosing against and for him. And this is just the beginning of a tumultuous time. And it's going to be painful for Mary to see what happens as well. And so remember, as amazing as this is, the birth of the Messiah is just the beginning of God producing what needs to happen to ultimately fulfill his plan for the redemption of humanity. He needs the life, the death, the resurrection, and the second coming, the second advent of Jesus that is detailed in the rest of the New Testament. All of those things have to happen as well. They're all vitally important for God's full plan to be fulfilled. And so just to make sure Mary and Joseph didn't dismiss this encounter with Simeon as the ramblings of a crazy man, look at what else God causes to happen at that exact moment. Look at verse 36. It says, There was also a prophet... Anna, the daughter of Peniel, of the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying, coming up to them when, at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child, spoke about Jesus to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. And so Anna carries on that work of proclamation. When Jesus, when Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. And so Mary and Joseph, they knew right away they had a big job ahead of them. All parents do, of course. You have a big job when it's time to raise some little one from birth all the way to adulthood. And they were part of God's plan to produce what needed to happen next in Jesus' life. They needed to raise God's son to adulthood so that he could fulfill the rest of his purpose, so that he could produce God's plan for the redemption of humanity. Now, of course, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, we've read to the end of the book, right? We've read the last page, and we know it all works out. We know they succeeded. We know how the rest of the story goes. And so we're told just briefly here that Jesus grew, and he became strong, and he became wise until he finally launched his public ministry. We know that that was around the age of 30, and then we see that he's reunited with his cousin John the Baptist, as far as we know. They only met one other time before that, when they were both still in their mother's wombs, and Mary walked up to Elizabeth, and she said, John, inside of Elizabeth's womb, jumped for joy because he sensed the Son of God was near him. And so they reunite as adults, and Jesus shows up at the Jordan River, and he asks John to baptize him. And John agrees to do that, and he publicly announces to all of his followers that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he tells his followers to begin following Jesus. He said, I must decrease, and he must increase. And so what does all that mean for us today? By the time we go to bed tonight, another Christmas will have come and gone. And we have to ask ourselves, did we learn anything new? Did we learn anything new this season? I mean, I've heard that story before. I've heard about the story of Jesus' birth, and I've heard about the story of Simeon and Anna at the temple, and I know Jesus grew up and he got baptized by John. I know all the stories. I've heard them a hundred times, a thousand times. But what did I learn this year? Did I learn anything new? Did I grow any closer to God in the process? Did we become any more like Jesus this year than we were last year? How have we grown? How have we changed? Have we had a positive impact on others? Have we helped others receive the advent of Jesus, the arrival of Jesus? Has Jesus arrived in the hearts of anyone that we know? At least partly because of something we said or because of something we did in their lives. How did we help other people encounter Jesus? How did he arrive in their hearts? Did we do anything like that? And I hope the answer for all of us is yes, that we can look back and say, oh, I did. I, I helped people know Jesus better because of these things that I did and these things that I said this year. And we can see that God's plans ultimately succeed. 
That means that everything he intends to do will actually come true exactly the way he intends it to do. He says in the Old Testament that his word does not return to him void. It always accomplishes the purpose for which he sends it out. We talked a couple of weeks ago that Jesus, as the word of God made flesh, Jesus is called the word of God by John several times, that that Old Testament verse is kind of a prophetic verse about Jesus. My word, my son, the son of God, goes out from me and he accomplishes everything I have sent him to do. He will not return to me empty. He will not return to me void. He will accomplish what he's been sent to do. And so we can see that those plans always succeed. And that means that all of his planning, all of his preparation, all of his proclamation about the second advent of Christ, the second arrival, the second coming of Christ, that's going to happen too. We can know with certainty that it's going to happen just as surely and just as specifically as the first advent did 2,000 years ago. And so just like Simeon and Anna, we want to be found ready when he arrives again. We want to prepare the way for Jesus' return, just as they did, both in our own hearts and in the hearts of others in the world around us, all the people that we have influence with, all the people we can talk to and help them prepare for the second arrival of Jesus. We need to maintain that perspective of prophetic hope that Jesus is coming back. We haven't reached the end of the story yet. We're still at the beginning of God's big plan. There's so much more of God's plan still to be revealed in His glorious unfolding of that plan. And so in this shorter message than usual today, I just wanted you to hear this story of Simeon and Anna because both of them had a prophetic hope and their faithfulness in waiting for and expecting the first advent, the first arrival of the Messiah encourages all of us to be likewise ready for the second advent, the second arrival of Jesus the Messiah as well. And they had been waiting expectantly. They had been believing that any day now, any moment now, the Messiah is going to arrive on the scene. And they were right. They got to meet him in person in the temple courts. Some of the first people really to meet him. He's only been there 40 days and they get to meet him. And now just think, we may actually be as close to the second coming of Christ as Simeon and Anna were to his first coming. Think about that for a moment. Let me say that again. We may actually be as close to the second coming of Christ as Simeon and Anna were to his first arrival while they were waiting expectantly for him at the temple courts. And so as we wrap things up this morning, I just want to encourage all of us to follow this example of Simeon and Anna and to be people who are preparing the way for the second advent of Christ. So let's talk about a couple of ways that they did that. How did Simeon and Anna prepare the way for the first advent of Jesus? Number one, they were faithful. We read their story, it's clear that they were faithful. God had made a promise to them that they were going to see Jesus, and they were banking on that promise. They believed God. They had faith. We define faith as the confidence that God is who he says he is and that he's going to do what he's promised to do. And Simeon and Anna, they had faith in God. They had confidence that he was exactly who he said he was and that he was always going to do exactly what he promised to do. And so they continued to serve God faithfully while they waited and trusted. And then the second thing they were is they were hopeful. They were hopeful. They were fully expecting, they were anticipating, they were trusting that the Messiah was actually going to come before they died, and it filled them with great hope and with great joy. It gave them great hope to know that this was something they could still look forward to in their old age. There was still something left to experience in life before they died. And even though in their time, times were very tough for the Hebrew people because of the occupation of the Romans. Uh, it was very difficult for them in the world that they lived in, but they never gave up hope that their Savior was coming soon. And then the third thing that they were is they were watchful. They stayed focused on what was ultimately important in life. Anna spent all of her time at the temple praying, fasting, uh, being ready for the most important event that was going to happen in her life. They didn't get distracted. They didn't get uh, off running after false gods and false uh, joy that wasn't really going to ultimately fulfill them. They made sure they were in the right place at the right time. They were at the temple. They were worshiping God. They were listening to God. They were watching for the signs. They were watching for the arrival of the Messiah. They were intent that they weren't 
weren't going to be distracted. They weren't going to look in the wrong places. They weren't going to look for the wrong things. They weren't going to misplace their priorities in life on other things because they didn't want to miss this fantastic prophetic event that God had promised them they would get to see before they died. And so they watched intently and they waited patiently. And you know, just like Israel was expecting their Messiah at the first advent, we're expecting the return of this same Messiah at his second advent, his second arrival. Back then and again today, we would say, you know, we're, we're a lot like that, the, the Hebrew people in that time. We have this increasing sense of peril in the world we live in. We live in a tough place, right? There's a lot of really difficult things that we have to see and hear about and deal with in our world today. It can be a kind of a scary place to live sometimes. And we're hopeful that an answer to that is coming soon. We're hopeful that deliverance is coming soon. We're hopeful that the Prince of Peace is coming back soon and that he's going to fix things before we humans mess up so bad we, we ruin the whole planet, we wipe it all out. Because the world has been quite a mess for a while now, but now we look around and we say, man, it just seems a little worse every year. It seems a little worse every day. There's a sense that something is different about the times in which we live. We feel a little bit more concern, a little more peril, a little more fear. Just like the Israelites sense that there's something different about the times in which they lived, and we can relate to that. Some of them were ready for the arrival of the Messiah, but most of them were not. And so that's the question I want us to consider today on this Christmas day. What about us? Are we ready? Are we ready for Christ's second advent? And the Bible tells us over and over again, we should be. Jesus repeatedly warned his followers to be ready for his return. He said, you know what? I'm going to come like a thief in the night. I'm going to come at a time that people aren't expecting me. And so I want you to stay awake. I want you to stay alert. I want you to be faithful. I want you to be hopeful. I want you to be watchful. Always be ready. I am coming soon. I'm going to make all things new. I'm going to make all things right again. Watch for me. Always be waiting and watching for my return. And the author of Hebrews echoes that idea. He tells us in Hebrews 9, verse 28, So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. It's going to be a joyous day when he returns. The Apostle Paul also encouraged Timothy to be eagerly looking forward to that return as well. He says in 2 Timothy 4, And now the prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And that prize that he's referring to, he says it's not just for me, but it's for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. We're supposed to be eagerly looking forward to his appearing, watching, waiting, expecting, hoping for the second coming, the second advent, the second arrival of Jesus. Now, this word we translate here as appearing in Timothy. Paul says, eagerly look forward to his appearing. That word in Greek is the Greek word epiphaneia. Epiphaneia occurs six times in the New Testament, and five of those times refer to the second advent of Christ. One time, Paul uses it to refer to the first coming of Christ. But epiphaneia is where we get our English word epiphany from. And so it can be understood, epiphany is a conspicuous manifestation. An epiphany is a glorious appearing. An epiphany isn't just someone arriving at your home in a vehicle or walking down the street towards your house. That's not the kind of appearing. That's not the kind of an arrival an epiphany is. And so when Jesus returns, Paul says, it is going to be a glorious unfolding of the rest of God's plan of redemption. When Jesus ascended to heaven, two angels appeared to his followers to explain to them what had just happened and explain to them what the second advent, the second arrival of Jesus would look like. Acts 1.11. These angels appear and say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has now been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. And Jesus himself told us this would be the scene of his return as well. He says in Mark 13, 26, They shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. That's a pretty conspicuous arrival, right? That's a pretty glorious unfolding of God's next stage in his plan. And so here's the question I want you to just ponder this Christmas morning. Are you looking forward to his appearing? Are you looking for his appearing? You can't miss something like that. 
Unlike the quiet, private nature of the first advent that occurred in this small Bethlehem stable, the entire world will see the second advent at the same time. But the Bible says not everyone's going to be watching for it. Not everyone's going to be eagerly expecting it and looking forward to it. They're not going to be ready for it. And so he wants us to help people be ready. We're supposed to help prepare the way. Prepare the way for the epiphany of Jesus, the second coming, the arrival of Jesus, the glorious unfolding of the rest of God's plan for humanity. God's plan to redeem humanity is all because of his great love for you, specifically for you. You matter deeply to God. This is all for you. The Bible shows us so clearly that if you had been the only person on earth who needed to be saved, if you were the only person on earth who had ever sinned and needed a Savior to come and pay your price for you on the cross, Jesus loves you enough, he would have come, even if it was just for you. He would have done everything he did specifically just for you. He loves you that much. And he wants to unfold this glorious plan that he has for your life. Stephen Curtis Chapman wrote a song, and it's called Glorious Unfolding, and it talks a little bit about how we can trust God's full plan for us. Even when we look around and we say things seem kind of dark and things seem kind of uncertain, and maybe you've gone through some difficult times this year. Maybe you've lost a loved one, or maybe you've lost a job, or you've lost some income, or you've lost a home, or you've lost, I don't know, we all lose things all the time. It's a tough world that we live in. And so even when we're struggling, and even when we look around, and even when we read the newspaper, and even when we watch TV and we go, oh, this world is such a mess. How can we have any hope? How can we have any faith? We can. God's gloriously unfolding all of that. So I want to close my time with you this morning by just singing a little piece of Stephen Curtis Chapman's song, Glorious Unfolding. And then we're going to pray, and we'll have a closing hymn together and let everyone get out of here and enjoy the rest of Christmas today as you prepare your hearts to receive whatever it is God wants to show you today. And as you prepare to share that good news with everyone God brings into your path today. So here are these words of Stephen Curtis Chapman. God's plan from the start for the world and your heart has been to show his glory and his grace forever revealing the depth and the beauty of his unfailing love. And the story has only begun, and this is going to be a glorious unfolding. Just you wait and see, and you will be amazed. We've just got to believe the story is so far from over. So hold on to every promise God has made to us and watch this glorious unfolding. We were made to run through fields of forever, singing songs to our Savior and King. So let us remember this life we're living. It's just the beginning of the beginning of this glorious unfolding we will watch and see and we will be amazed if we just keep on believing the story is so far from over and hold on to every promise god has made to us we'll see his glorious unfolding would you pray with me please father god i thank you that you've shown us your plan and your preparation you've proclaimed what you're about to do to all of us you've shown us the way to be successful in whatever path you call us to we too need to know how to plan and how to prepare and how to proclaim it and then how to actually produce what we said we were going to do god thank you for this series that you've led us through and your plans to redeem humanity thank you that we culminate this series today on this holiest of days the day we celebrate the arrival 
of the Son of God into our world. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus, thank you for being the greatest gift the world has ever known. Thank you for your promise to return one day and set everything right to finish what you started, to finally produce this perfect world that we read about in Scripture where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more death, no more evil. Everything's right with the world like it was in the very beginning. We look forward to that day when you come again. Help us be ready for your appearing. Help us celebrate what this day is all about, the beginning of this great adventure of following you. Help us be people who are not just Christmas and Easter people, but people who walk with you 365 days a year, realizing there's so much to the story that we always need to learn and share with others that we meet. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.